I made a mistake. No, right. Shit, shit, shit. It was late, so I wasn't really thinking. Usually get a blocked nose when I'm in here, but I heard that Sage is great for that. I thought this would help. Cool. That's sorted. I fought, but in the corner of my eye, I could still see a cloud of smoke rising up from the other end of the roof. Almost paralyzed, I didn't know what to do. What have you done? What if this gets worse during the night? What if the fire finds its way down through the tiles and into the loft? What if you're a victim of your own arson and you can't prove it was an accident and you end up homeless? What if I end up homeless? My rational brain knew this was all ridiculous. This is ridiculous. A little bit of wet, burnt sage can't burn your house down from the outside. You're gonna be fine. But I've always been a bit of a warrior. I don't mean chronically, but enough. I was never fun to get high with at school because I was always worrying about what that noise or footstep was. The fuck was I feel a bit more mature now than I did rolling blunts in the bike shed, but I'm not facing a slap on the wrist here. I could lose everything. I could die. The insecurity makes a lot of sense. Growing up, if things got broken in our house, it was not getting replaced. We just had to deal with the fact that it was gone. It wasn't until I was 17, at college, with my first job, that I buy an item of clothing that was truly mine and not a hand-me-down from one of my older brothers. But as far as I can tell, our mum was not bothered with keeping up with the Joneses. And that's a good thing. I never felt like I should have the newest and best thing just to impress other people. I got what was well-made and durable, aka whatever had survived after enduring years of my older brothers stretching, sweating and farting. So at 22, when I moved to this crumbling, piss-stained neighbourhood called Southmead, I was mostly surprised at how much people seemed to worship the short-lived highs of, say, a brand new car, iPhone, or t-shirt. But around that time, I started reading this book called Sapiens by Noah Harari, and it got me thinking about the nature of money. Harari writes, Money is the only trust system created by humans that can bridge almost any cultural gap. This trust is invested not in humans, communities, or sacred values, but in money itself. Money doesn't encourage people to trust other humans, but to trust money itself. With this in mind, I took a walk through the junkyard of the neighborhood I was living in, and I noticed the Monster Energy Drink adverts plastered onto every bus stop, and the cans themselves stamped into street corners or gripped in sleep-deprived teenagers' hands. I walked by the death trap of a roundabout that had caused at least two collisions an hour, and I admired the genius of the repair garage, so conveniently placed beside it. And I thought to myself, Sapiens is right. Look at us. Money doesn't care about human happiness or suffering, convenience or inconvenience. If a lake gets poisoned and the local population gets cancer, resulting in more cancer treatment and medicine sales, that's good for business. Nearly everyone in Southmead has a nice car. I'm talking Teslas, Mercedes, those big SUV Porsches. People own these beautiful cars that are parked outside houses with broken or boarded up windows. Houses that look like you might find missing people inside. But if you do happen to glance inside, you'll see giant screens and shelves full of brand new devices owned by depressed, downgraded humans. It kind of feels like the mentality is having something that looks expensive matters more than quality, effect on mental health, or even your bank balance. But we're conditioned to long for this lifestyle, even if we desperately can't afford it, because the seduction is everywhere we look. You want to see what the inside of insert your favourite celebrity's mansion looks like? No worries, he'll show you. Hello MTV, welcome to my crib. Oh and what's that in their ear? No way. Overpriced, wireless, plastic oval? If you get one, then maybe people will think you're rich or cool too. And then they'll finally know how much better than them you are. And guess what? You're probably eligible for that credit card, baby. We'll give you a definite for yes or no in seconds. So during the year that I lived in the ghetto, I visited my girlfriend's parents' house in a nice part of town called Bolton Le Sands. There's wealth and good fortune there, but the people of Bolton Le Sands will threaten to call the police if you even look at their house. They've mostly gone mad trying to hold on to the precious little that they've cobbled together. And in the process, 
forgotten how to enjoy it. I started thinking that they may have more stuff, but essentially they struggle just as much as people with far less. Not always financially, but many of the people who look wealthy are only really that as long as they have their jobs. So what they have isn't financial security because all of their income is spent on liabilities like the house or the car or the bills. They probably just accommodate their lifestyle to their income. The same anxiety found in Southmead is there too because they're playing the same game, just with more expensive toys. And I suppose that often enough, the anxiously rich are one or two unlucky moves away from being as broke as everyone else. A few weeks ago, I was in the cinema watching House of Gucci and everything I'd been thinking about just started to make sense. The way Patrizia is desperate to be a part of the Gucci's world is kind of like those rotten houses in Southmead where their pretty cars parked outside. And the Gucci's cling to the little power that they have left like the snobs in bottomless sands. People spend so much time fighting over the cake, but they don't even know how to cook something they'd actually like to eat. The real Patrizia Gucci even says, Better to uh, cry in Rolls Royce than to be happy in on a bicycle. That's, that's for sure. But here I am, every day, happy to be cycling on my bicycle. I don't want a part of this. The next day, it's icy outside, and I'm running with my dog Ben, a border collie with a strong herding instinct. Ben's decided that he'd like to herd me up, but since I don't have eyes in the back of my head, I'm unaware of the 20kg bullet that's aimed at my legs. I'm just skipping along quite happily when my dog collides with my legs and throws me off balance. My phone jolts out of my hand and meets the concrete cycle track. Black screen, cracked, unfixable. As I came to terms with this, I thought about getting a brick phone, downgrading from smartphone to not so smartphone. Maybe this is how it's meant to be, I said to myself, and it kind of felt that I had the opportunity to transcend my sorry reliance on this addictive rectangle and this endless consumerist game. I kind of felt like I was a caterpillar in liquid form inside of a cocoon but rather than busting out as a free and colourful butterfly, I ordered a new phone and was shit out the other end the same old boring caterpillar. By now, you're wondering what any of this is supposed to mean. Well, me too. But basically, there's more to life than riches and YouTube clout. And sometimes I just have to remind myself of that. The best things in life are not free, but you can't buy them in a shop. Like peace of mind that you haven't accidentally set your house on fire. And yeah, I knew that the smoke I was looking at might not be smoke. The main reason I didn't call the fire brigade was because I wasn't really sure if my house was gonna burn down or if that was even possible. You see, where I was looking is the place where steam usually comes off the boiler. But in my panicked, frenzied state, I didn't really want to accept that. But thankfully, I tired myself out worrying and then I never woke up because of carbon monoxide poisoning. No, no, I did wake up and I went to the window and the smoke was still there. But it wasn't smoke, it was steam carefully rising up from the boiler. Huh. I need to make some more money.